It's always a good idea in a place of strong philosophy, which Greece has always been, to begin with a definition, and so I do. It's a definition of Zionism, which I take to be, according to my usage, the founding and maintaining of Israel within roughly its original 1948 borders. And the question arises about it, has Zionism, the founding and maintaining of Israel within roughly its 1948 borders, been right or wrong? A question also arises about a second thing that I would like to define, which is neo-Zionism. And that is the taking from the Palestinians at least their freedom in the last one-fifth of their historic homeland, historic Palestine. The second question that may exercise you still is the question of why the 9-11 attack on the United States of America was wrong, if it was wrong. And secondly, you might wish to direct your attention to the question of who shares moral responsibility for the 9-11 attack on America. The third question, what of the American and British war on Iraq, right or wrong? And then, fourthly, the terrorism that has succeeded that war, the terrorism exemplified by the 7-7 attack on the tubes and the buses in London, right or wrong? And interestingly, who are its effective friends and who are its effective enemies? The effective friends and the enemies of such terrorism as 7-7. With respect to these large questions of right and wrong, it seems to me clear that there is a division of intellectual labor a division of intellectual labor. It must be the case, clearly, that historians have a part to play in dealing with these questions. It is equally true that good journalists have a part to play in dealing with these questions. Economists will want to push their way in, and also bad journalists. And indeed, bad journalists do have a part to play. John Stuart Mill held the view, quite rightly, that the expression of false opinions was as important as the expression of true opinions because the expression of false opinions led to a fuller and greater understanding of the true ones. With respect to this division of labor, it's a thought of mine, maybe a dream, maybe a dream that will come unstuck this very evening, that analytic philosophy has a part to play. It's part of this division of intellectual labor. Its contribution will be the contribution of analytic philosophy in all its parts and concerns. And that is a concentration on the ordinary logic of intelligence. I don't for a moment think that the ordinary logic of intelligence is owned by analytic philosophy, but it concentrates more on it than anything else does partly as a result of having fewer facts to deal with. It's also the case that analytic philosophy brings to bear on these questions a certain amount of progress in moral philosophy. There has been a certain amount of progress on the very question of the nature of judgments of right and wrong, whether those judgments are truths or falsehoods or what. So. The idea is to look at the four great questions and others that will follow them from the point of view of analytic philosophy. And if you do that, you will necessarily go against the convention of this or any other time. If you are guided by the logic, the logic is a matter of clarity and consistency, clarity and consistency and validity and also completeness those things alone, if you follow 
this ideal of analytic philosophy, you will find yourself against the conventions of the time. Now, you might think that philosophy is, after all, what is done, as we say in English, in an ivory tower, and that it is somehow out of touch with, if you like, the real matters which um, should govern reflection on right and wrong and these things. And there are a number of real matters which are intruded upon us when we start thinking of these questions. For example, there is a general idea, head by a great deal of the Western press, for example, that with respect to any disputes, negotiation is to be preferred to force or violence. Negotiation is always the right thing. I shan't go into that question very far, but simply make a remark or two, as in the case of um, other things that might come to mind as helping us out in reflecting on these four large questions. Here is a thought that comes to mind. Is the woman who is in the course of being raped, the woman who is in the course of being raped, if she can stop him by hitting him on the head, is she to remonstrate with him instead? Is she to negotiate instead? No one believes it. Consider the Russian tanks coming into Germany at the end of the Second World War to bring to an end the Holocaust. Does anyone believe that they ought to have stopped and called the conference in Geneva instead? No one believes it. It's clear that there is much to be said for negotiation as against force or violence in certain circumstances, but there can't be an iron rule to the effect that negotiation is the path we ought always to follow. You might suppose that we ought to guide ourselves by international law. We ought to look at considerations of international law in considering the four large questions. Well, there are large difficulties about that, of which the first one is, it's not very clear what international law comes to. And indeed, the British and the Americans have made it up on the hoof with respect to Iraq. But in any case, our question is not legality, but right or wrong. And the history of the law is littered with moral mistakes of the most savage kind. Our concern is not legality, but right or wrong. You might again think, as in the case of negotiation, that there is something to be said for going by law and going by negotiation, but you must admit exceptions to it. Was the Holocaust, by the way, illegal in Germany? A question that one can focus upon for a moment. You must, if you're going to attempt to go by international law, have some means of deciding when it's okay and when it's not. You need some general principle, don't you? Let me skip over some other alternatives which are mentioned on the handout for this lecture and come to the principal one that we are urged to take up. We understand from our politicians that we live in an age of a Manichaean struggle between good and evil. And the good is democracy and the evil is terrorism. A Manichaean struggle. Should we, in thinking about these questions, even thinking about them from the point of view of an analytic philosopher, should we be guided by democracy? Should we be guided by democracy? Is the answer to these questions, these four large questions and others like them, to be got by reflecting on democratic government's verdicts? There's been a lot of argumentation for democracy, but I put it to you that the argument for democracy, being guided by democracy, is in fact reduced to this proposition. Any strong and good argument for something can be reduced to a clear English sentence or a clear Greek sentence. And the overwhelming argument for democracy is, in a piece of English, two heads are better than one, and more heads are better than two. Two heads are better than one, and more heads are better than two. In which case, if you have a government in which more heads participate, you get a better upshot. 
you get better judgments, you get better policies, you get better societies, better international arrangements than if you go by any other kind of government, totalitarian government, government of oligarchy, anything else. That is a strong argument for democracy, as I put it to you, the strongest argument. It depends, however, on certain considerations. Two heads are better than one, and more heads are better than two, if the heads get to equally and freely express what is in them, equally and freely express what is in them. The argument must depend on such a consideration. If you consider American and British democracy, and I suspect Greek democracy, and you divide the voting populations into deciles or tenths, and you consider the top tenth in economic terms, top tenth in economic terms, wealth and income, and compare it with the bottom tenth in economic terms, wealth and income. And you make a reasonable assumption that there is a correlation between economic power and influence and political power and influence within these democracies. It is, I think, a safe estimate that the top tenth has a thousand times the political power and influence of the bottom tenth. Those who do a little mathematics will remember for a start that the bottom tenth has virtually zero wealth, zero wealth, at least a thousand times then. It is an absurdity to suppose, as I suppose for a part of my life and indeed wrote, it is an absurdity to suppose that there is some approximation to equality of political influence and power in our democracies. But you might say, well, even if there isn't equality, there is freedom. There is freedom, very different from a totalitarian state or something like that. And that gives some recommendations to the upshots of these <coughs> democracies. If you cast your mind back over the political philosophy of the last couple of decades, you will, some of you, remember a lot of liberalism and a lot of conservatism, which is to the effect that there is a conflict between equality and freedom. If you try to get an equal society, that will conflict, that will conflict with an awful lot of liberty and freedom. It seems to me that something else is the case. Here is another quick example for you. Suppose you and I are in serious dispute about something, very serious dispute about something, and we are strikingly unequal in that I have a gun and you have no gun. We are strikingly unequal in that I have a gun and you have no gun. What is your freedom in this circumstance of radical inequality? your freedom reduces to zero. Far from it being the case that in important matters there is a conflict between equality and freedom, they run together, they converge, they are effectively one thing. To return then to where we were, it is not true either that in our democracies there is equality in the expression of opinions and judgments and wants, and there isn't freedom in the expression of those desires and wants and judgments either. Our democracies are merely primitive democracies. They are merely hierarchic democracies. You may think that there is a lot to be said for them, a lot to be said for them from the point of view of uh, members of them, like you and me. But that's not the question. The question is, are they a good means of deciding right and wrong? They are a good means, only if two heads are better than one and more heads are better than two, which I accept, but only also if there is equality and freedom in the expression of what is in the heads. Now, once again, as with negotiation and uh, international law and other things I might have mentioned, you might think there's something to be said for negotiation sometimes, and uh, equally, there's something to be said for international law, at least sometimes. 
and there's something to be said for the upshots of the democratic process. But that position puts you into this circumstance. You need a method of telling when negotiation is right, and when international law is right, and when democracy is coming up with the right answer. You need a principle. You need a principle of right and wrong. You can't avoid that question.